Funded Today Nation, welcome back to the Funded Today podcast. Man, sometimes I feel like it's been forever since we've last chatted. Today, we're going to revive the subject of what to do when your campaign goes wrong. In this case, so terribly wrong that you actually need to restart it. So we're going to talk all about the mechanics of relaunches, both voluntary and involuntary. So if you ever received one of those dreaded notices that your campaign has been suspended, don't panic. We've got your back. Let's get started. The Funded Today podcast is brought to you by FundedToday.com. Funded Today is a premier marketing and video agency. From startups to crowdfunding to Amazon and beyond, Funded Today has helped their clients generate hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. If you'd like help launching or growing your business, visit www.fundedtoday.com to speak with one of their experts. Welcome back to Get Funded Today, the Funded Today podcast. I'm Zach Smith. And I'm Thomas Alvord. And it feels like it's been forever since we've been back on. So we are excited to get back at it. And I think you're going to love the topic today. But just before we proceed, we just wanted to briefly remind you about our growing array of free resources we've been developing to benefit crowdfunding campaigners and inventors just like you. Are you unsure if your campaign media is as effective as it could be? If so, then our beautiful Ultimate Crowdfunding Page Design Analyzer overviews some basic principles of creating persuasive campaign media as it helps you to evaluate your own video and page. Are you worried about missing anything important as you prepare for your launch day? If so, then our thorough Ultimate Crowdfunding Pre-Launch Checklist lists point by point what you can do to help minimize your regrets. Or are you craving a crash course about running a successful campaign from conceptualization to fulfillment? and beyond. If so, then our powerful Ultimate Crowdfunding Success Guide synthesizes all of our collective wisdom about successful crowdfunding into a single comprehensive reference handbook. You can download any or all of these completely for free right now on our website. We will link to them in the show notes as well. And I got one more for you. Funded Today, the book is very close to completion. We have spent years writing this book, literally years, and I'd say we are within months from finally releasing this book to the public. Zach, it was actually four years ago, I believe, that we started discussing the book and even having people asking us about a book. It's incredible that finally, after nearly four years of working on this, it's about to come to the market. All of our wisdom distilled in a book. I'm excited. Yeah, it, it's crazy. I can't believe four years, Thomas. That That's crazy. For me, I was thinking like two or three, but yeah, now that I look back on it, my goodness, you're going to love this book. And the reason it's taken so long is, like Thomas mentioned, we wanted to make sure we got it right. We wanted to make sure we had learned all the ropes, that we had tested every theory. This book is no fluff, straight to the point, make it happen. And I think it's going to be the best book ever written on crowdfunding. And I'm perfectly confident to say that in front of anybody. So you're going to love it. We will give you some teasers in upcoming episodes so that you can get prepared for this. And if you want the book, email us, let us know, and we'll make sure you get on that wait list so you can get those early bird discount prices. today. We're actually going to draw from one of the chapters in that book to talk about the mechanics of successful relaunches. We touched upon this topic already in some of our previous podcast episodes, especially number four about failure, pivoting, and success, so you'll want to review that one. But we felt that the details of relaunches were important enough to merit their own episode. Firstly, we're going to review briefly how to analyze your campaign success factors. We're going to discuss how to tell if your campaign would benefit from a relaunch or not, basically whether you should give up or not. And we're going to examine how to relaunch a struggling campaign as effectively as possible. Secondly. We're also going to teach you how you can minimize the risk of your campaign from getting suspended, plus exactly what you can do if it does get wrongfully suspended in the form of a proven seven-step checklist. So although we all always hope for the best, we're going to start getting you prepared for the worst, just in case your campaign doesn't go exactly as planned. So Thomas, to kick us off, how do you handle voluntary relaunches? That is a great, great question. Most people don't realize it, and people who come into their campaign, and it should be like this, right? Your campaign is going to succeed. Everyone's going to love it. They're all going to bow down to your product and give you all their money because your product is absolutely amazing, right? That is always the dream. Otherwise, we wouldn't be putting in sleepless nights and putting in capital and sacrifices to bring it to fruition. But the reality is campaigns fail about twice as often as they succeed. And when I say fail and succeed, I'm talking about just hitting their goal. Right? Some people might hit a goal of 50000 but really in their mind, they needed or wanted to raise 200000 And so in their mind, they failed. So you got to realize coming into it, failure is normal. So don't set yourself up, no pun intended, for failure, right? You got to go into it realizing 
people might bite and people might not bite. And you really don't know. And I think we've shared before the, the great irony is the people who go on to raise a million dollars very often are the people who are like, holy smokes, I thought I was going to raise 75, maybe a hundred thousand. This, this is blowing my mind. And then the people who are like, ah, my campaign's the best. I'm going to raise a million. I'm going to raise 5 million. And it's like, oh, you raised 3000. And after sending a lot of traffic, people aren't interested. So again, you got to realize failure is normal and, and don't beat yourself up, right? That is just part of the process. Please go see episode four about failure, pivoting, and success. It's important to understand those principles. And uh, Thomas, I think you have a really good point. When you face failure, I think it's important to remember that the market is what matters most. We've got a whole episode on that one as well. Number 11, you need to strive to obtain as much feedback as possible from your backers about why the market isn't responding well enough to what you're offering. Crowdfunding backers, as we've said before, are generally very willing to provide you with great feedback about your product. The problem may be your product, your price, your platform, your funding goals, your reward structure, your timing, your media, your marketing, something else, or perhaps some combination of such factors. Remember, that's our seven Ps, episode number six, all about helping you figure out how to analyze what may be going wrong. And then you have to learn from that feedback to pivot into doing something even better. And this feedback can be your triple F, and there's a whole episode on triple F, your friends, family, and fools who commit to support you. And maybe they do support you, but they're saying, I'm just doing it, but you're getting their honest feedback. Hey, I think the price is really high, or I don't care about this. I don't, I'm not into this type of thing, whatever it might be. And that's also where having an email list is valuable. And again, if you launch your campaign on Kickstarter, on Indiegogo, you can message the backers. And granted, it's not the best pool, but because they've actually backed your product and really you want to get the feedback for the people who haven't supported your project, but you can get that feedback and that's super valuable. And again, you got to realize you just got to take the punches, right? And bad feedback is good feedback because it's helping you see where to improve, right? It's kind of like they say, if you go to the doctor and you have some chronic sickness and you can't figure out what it is, you're hoping that you can go to the doctor and the doctor can tell you, this is the disease you have. This is the problem you have, right? Because once you know what the disease is, once you know what the problem is, then you know how to troubleshoot it, what to address. But until you even know what that is, you got to get that feedback, right? I love that doctor's analogy, Thomas, because for literally years of my life, I had something going on in my upper shoulder quadrant area of my, of my back. And I never knew what was going on. And I would try to rub it. I try to massage it. I try to do all the other things. And eventually I got an MRI, just like you're describing, and the MRI revealed a partially torn left labrum. And from that point forward, as crazy as it sounds, the pain basically stopped because I knew what I could do to work around it. I knew there was an option for surgery. I knew what I could do to strengthen the surrounding muscles. And literally ever since then, I haven't had any trouble with this partially torn left labrum for exactly the reason that you've described. Yeah. And, and so you have to do the diagnostic if you can. And maybe you don't have a good product market fit. And again, that episode 11, I think is one of my favorites. So go watch that. Now, in some cases, you can easily solve these problems without ever needing to relaunch. Sometimes it's a confusion about what people are getting. Or sometimes it's the price point and you can lower the price point while your campaign is still live. However, in other cases, your problems may be serious enough that it's actually best to just completely start over. And believe it or not, this can be a very effective strategy. When you launch a new campaign, most often you're going to see a spike in organic attention during the first few days of your campaign. And it's nice to get a second chance at this if you didn't have everything right enough the first time. And this is especially true when your products, your prices, your goals, your timing and or your presentation needs serious revision. For example, Coolest Cooler, one of the most well-known campaigns uh, because they raised over 10 million, but also because they failed to deliver and there was all this uh, PR about that. But in, in any case, when they initially launched, they didn't even hit their goal or maybe they did, but they were hardly raising anything. I, I, I believe they didn't hit their goal. I'll give you a little backstory on that one, Thomas. They even had some of the best internet marketers because I'm kind of from that space. They had guys like Brendan Burchard. 
guys with, I think, a million person email list or something, right? Sending out an email to his list. And even that couldn't get them above a couple hundred thousand dollars raised. Yeah. And, and so with Coolest Cooler, when they had initially launched, it was around wintertime. People aren't thinking about buying a cooler in the wintertime, right? And so they relaunched in a better season. They launched during the summertime with a finished design and a lower funding goal. And the rest is history. They absolutely crushed it. Okay. How about, how about this example, Thomas? Satoshi won. They're faring horribly on Indiegogo. They don't get any pledges at all. But then they relaunch on Kickstarter. They did higher funded today. And then they have great success. Literally, it was just a platform choice. Yep. And then the third example, I, I feel proud because I feel like I was the one who found this issue. You were. But it was Shotbox, right? Shotbox is this product that allows you to basically put whatever product in this little box, and then you can put your phone on the top and then take a picture. And their, their product, they had actually launched another Kickstarter and it had done well. And so they had another Kickstarter with the complimentary product and they launched and it completely failed. They weren't going to hit their, well, they had hired us, right? They weren't going to hit their goal. They hired us saying, hey, let's try to get it to our goal. I think it was only 20,000 or so. And it wasn't even going to hit it. And I looked at it, I analyzed it and I realized, oh, their video and their page needs to be tweaked. They are not describing the product sufficiently well that people know what it is. And, and in this case, we didn't even get feedback. I was able to just look at it as an outside pair of eyes because I hadn't been working on the campaigns, right? So I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I think you make a good observation there too, Thomas. Sometimes we are so entrenched with our own product, even as marketers of the product, like we are sometimes at Funded Today. In this case, since you weren't even involved in the marketing on this to that point in time, you were able to look at this from a fresh perspective. Sometimes when nothing's going right, go ask somebody who has no clue about anything about your product. Hey, why is nobody backing this? Well, what, what do you see as any problems here? Or, you know, what do you, what do you like about this? <laughs> right. And, and I just misspoke. I said, I didn't know what I didn't know. That's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say is when you're working on a project, for example, you forget or you don't know what you know. And so when you work with somebody else, they know what they don't know. And what I, what I mean by that is you might look at the product and you know exactly how it works, exactly what it means. Maybe there's acronyms. Maybe there's other industry terminology you're using that other people aren't familiar with. Just basic stuff like that. So if somebody else who doesn't know anything comes and looks at it, they can be like, this doesn't make sense. In any case, we relaunched Shotbox and it raised 10 times as much. It, it raised over $100,000. So again, sometimes there might be issues you can tweak mid-campaign and keep on selling with your current campaign. But other times, a complete relaunch will be necessary. And it's not a bad thing. It can be very effective. I want to kind of step outside the box here for a second. I, I read an article recently. I love Ryan Holiday. If you've read some of his books, Thomas and I actually got started on it on one of his books called Trust Me, I'm Lying. It's all about manipulation of the media and, and different things like that. Fascinating study. But he's got a He's got a lot of that sounds kind of bad, Zach. Hey, yeah, we, <laughs> we love this book. It's about manipulating. The I mean, we he's got a it. catchy title. Trust me, I'm lying. So it's not it's not necessarily negative. It's about how to use the media to get attention for your big idea. And he has all kinds of crazy, crazy good ideas that are they're both fascinating. And sometimes you know a little bit you're like, huh, interesting. But he also writes a lot about business. And I I, I read this last night and it, it stuck out as we're talking about relaunches and, and different things. And and maybe this is the right time, maybe it's not, but I'll, I'll share it anyway. It, it goes like this. This is from his article entitled, I don't have faith in myself, I have evidence. He said, a few years ago, an interviewer asked Jay-Z about his incredible self-assuredness. It's a good question. He does seem like a person with unending faith in himself. How else could he wrap the things that he wraps? How else could he have gone from the Marcy Projects to Madison Square? The truth is, it wasn't self-belief that got him there. And then he does this quote. People don't realize I put a lot of my life into what I'm doing right now. I didn't just have a hit record and get lucky. I put a lot of my life into it. So the things that come out of it is not due to bravado and arrogance. I have confidence because of the work that I put in. And I put in so much work. And then he contrasts it the following way. That's the hard way. People prefer Rick Ross's line in that way. People prefer his way. And then Rick Ross goes, our faucets used to drip. I used to ride the bench, but it was written in cursive for this king to exist. Man, what are you talking about? To me, these two approaches are a perfect illustration of the difference between ego and confidence, belief and evidence, delusion and ambition. Both men are successful, but one lives in reality, the other in fantasy. And Jay-Z is a lot more successful than the other two. And now here's the line that stuck out to me the most. 
on a regular basis, because this is Thomas and me too. This happens to us probably every single week. On a regular basis, I get emails from people who are trying to do big things. They are convinced they have the some multi-billion dollar idea, a genius pitch, some brilliant artistic concept. They also have com- complete certainty that it will be a success. I just need you for the marketing. How many times do we hear that, Thomas? All the time. It's always fascinating to see what this certainty is based on because it almost always turns out to be, well, nothing, just hubris, just illusion, faith without evidence, wishful thinking. They think their success is written in cursive when really success and confidence are carved from the work produced. Anyway, I just, I just love that. And I think as we're talking about relaunches and when relaunch, it's kind of important to consider what Ryan writes here. Like we're saying, you need to get that feedback. What does the community, what does other people think about your product? Do they want it? And luckily, the crowdfunding community is actually relatively pretty nice to those who solicit feedback and also to those who relaunch. If you restart, it's not going to count as a strike against you. You can treat your current backers much like pre-launch leads that you can mobilize to basically maximize your relaunch day success. So just make sure you communicate regularly, openly with your current backers, with the crowdfunding community as you prepare to do a relaunch. So your backers and and the community constantly understand what's happening and that they're not surprised. You don't want to launch a new campaign, cancel your other one, and then everyone's surprised, right? You want to have this dialogue going on. And so when you relaunch, they, they know what's happening. Most importantly, kind of from a technical perspective, on Kickstarter, when you cancel your project, you don't get their information. So you want to get their names, their phone numbers, whatever you can, even if you only had 50 to 100 backers, because those 50 to 100 backers, when you relaunch, are going to be your first earliest supporters for a successful relaunch. So it's important to gather that info as best you can. Say, hey, it didn't work out this time. I'm planning on relaunching a month from now. I'm cleaning up the following things based upon the feedback that all 50 of you guys gave me. And I want you to be my early supporters. And I'm going to give you the early bird discount when we relaunch. Can you please give me your name, email, phone number, whatever you have, so that I can let you know the moment we launch? Yep. Otherwise, you cancel your campaign and you can still do updates through the platform, but you're limited to that. These are voluntary relaunches. You're voluntarily canceling your current campaign and then relaunching. But sometimes you don't have that luxury to voluntarily cancel your campaign. Sometimes out of the middle of nowhere, you get that email, Zach. Mm-hmm. And that leads us perfectly to topic two. How do you handle involuntary relaunches? So in some rare cases, you may need to relaunch your campaign, even though it is faring really well due to what's known as an involuntary cancellation or a suspension, essentially. Involuntary cancellations arise because platform staff on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or wherever else you launch, I guess, believe that you violated their rules, whether they're right or wrong. So it's important to keep their rules. We'll link to those in the comments or in our show notes so you can have those and to render it sufficiently obvious that you're doing so. Here's an example. One client did a follow-up campaign after Indiegogo on Kickstarter with a larger battery and just a few other changes, but they didn't make those changes very obvious, so Kickstarter nearly canceled it. Fortunately, they they did get some emails and some warnings, and this client was able to explicitly point out all the changes to Kickstarter staff in order to avoid being canceled. Lots of other examples. Uh, Little Heroes kind of comes to mind. They had some copyright issues with Marvel and Disney, They had a pretty cool product. We even mentioned it as a product of the week here on this podcast, but it was suspended by Kickstarter because they were taking IP that wasn't their own. And they had said that they had licensing agreements when in fact they likely did not. And uh, Marvel got mad. So that was a pretty, that was a pretty big example. And then sometimes when you try to run a bunch of campaigns on the platform all at once, Kickstarter doesn't like that. They want you to fulfill one product and then another and another. And trust me, it's, it's smart that Kickstarter does this. This is a really good thing they do. They don't want you launching 10 different projects at once because it's hard enough to get one off the ground. And if you're trying to spin three or four different plates at the same time, you're going to have even more difficulty. And more difficulty is bad for the platform because then people think you scam them when in reality, you probably just had a difficult time bringing new business to life because bringing new business to life is in and of itself very hard. Now, and, and Kickstarter understands that some campaigns will fail and they want to mitigate that, right? I know of some creators in some certain categories that they will generate or create a new campaign, say every six months, but they've delivered like on 20 campaigns. And so even though the prior one is still in production, Kickstarter is fine with them launching again. So if you are a serial 
well-known, notorious, and a good way Kickstarter creator, then yeah, you don't got to worry about how many campaigns you launch. But I, I'm pretty sure we have seen pretty much everything. And we, given the number of campaigns we work with, we have actually worked with more suspended campaigns and have actually helped save more suspended campaigns than anybody else in the entire crowdfunding space worldwide. I, I bet my money on it. And I remember talking with somebody, oh, it was probably two or three years back, and he said, hey, why does Funded Today get so many campaigns suspended? And I said, what are you talking about? We don't. And they're like, yeah, look at these campaigns that you guys have worked on that got suspended. You guys get so many campaigns suspended. I went and I looked at it and, and we, we get all of the information of every campaign that's on Kickstarter and on Indiegogo and we can see how much every campaign raises, what, what the eventual end state is, did it hit their goal, did it not hit their goal, was it suspended? And so we can run analytics. And it's, it's been a, a couple of years since I ran it. I, I guess I probably should have ran it before this episode. And I forget if it's like one in 500 or it's like one in a thousand, maybe it was one in 10,000, but I'm pretty sure it was like one in a thousand campaigns get suspended. Again, I, I, I wish I had the number, but basically I ran the numbers and then I looked at the number of campaigns we worked on and I said, it actually isn't that different. It's actually about the same. We just work with so many campaigns that by virtue of statistics, we are going to work with more suspended campaigns. We are going to deal with more suspensions just because we work with more campaigns than anybody else in the world. Um, and, and also, you know, it, it, we, we talked about this a while back with the Kurahana Knives, right? They were on track to only raise maybe 50,000, 100,000. I, I can't remember the number. And we worked and ended up raising, was it a million or two million? And we were running marketing in every country in the entire world, virtually. And we get this letter. Well, Kickstarter freezes the campaign. They're about to suspend it. They, they give you a, basically Kickstarter gives you a, a 48 hour notice saying, we're going to suspend your campaign. Here's what you need to do. You can message your backers, let them know it's going to be suspended. And Kickstarter, this is one of my, again, we love Kickstarter, but we have some pet peeves. I guess that's any relationship, right? But they send the letter out like Friday afternoon. It could be fluke, but it seems like it happens so often, does it not, Zach? It's like, why are you sending it Friday afternoon to then make it so there's like hardly anyone to talk with? So again, we've dealt with, with all of this, but basically they suspended it and they said, hey, you're violating German law because you're saying that the knives are made with Japanese still or it's Japanese manufactured. I can't remember. And it was like this little nuance that had to change to be compliant with German law. And so we're funded today is a marketing agency in the United States. Our client is in the UK. They're manufacturing this using Japanese still or Japanese manufacturing. And then we're having to deal with a German law in terms of what is allowed for advertising. And literally because of the German law, Kickstarter was going to suspend the campaign. And I remember talking to Zach, it, it's, it's an irony that if people work with us, we potentially could get your product suspended because we're going to make the whole world see your product if it's a good product. So if, if there's a little nuance with some random law, like in Germany, then we might run into that. But again, we were able to resolve it because we've dealt with this so much, but it does happen. And by the way, Thomas, Kurehana, 2459335 bucks between Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So your point is spot on. This product that was going to raise hardly any money, that was $2.5 million. And that creates a lot of exposure across the world. And if you, in some ways, that's really good. You're going to figure out really quickly what IP you might be violating, what copyrights, what patents, what kind of issues. So there's a chance we might make your project so successful that it's going to get seen by the whole world. But to your point, we have never had a campaign suspended in our entire lives for something that Funded Today has done directly. And I think that's something we can be really proud of. We always market honestly and ethically, and we've never had any issues with the nearly 3,000 projects that we've run. So we still recommend Kickstarter over Indiegogo, even though Indiegogo seems to be a lot more lenient when it comes to suspensions, because I think Kickstarter's suspension policy 
as much as we wish there was a little more transparency, does create a lot more trust. And trust leads to long-term retention of backers. And long-term retention of backers means that you're going to have more people who back more projects just like yours. One example that, that comes to mind, Zach, is Lobster Bag. Definitely review Lobster Bag if you want to kind of see how that ended out. It actually ended in a pretty good way because of our petition of Kickstarter. We were able to get a relaunch. We were able to make it successful. We hope involuntary cancellation or suspension doesn't happen to you, but if it does, we have you covered. And this is our third and final topic, involuntary relaunch checklist. We put this together to kind of go over what you should do should the worst happen to you. And sometimes this can be the best thing that happens to and, and we should probably be selling this involuntary relaunch checklist for $10,000. The, the reality is most people will never need it, but the people who are going to need it, this could be the difference between losing $100,000 or being able to still collect $100,000 from your backers. So this is super valuable for anyone who ever has this situation come. And if you do work with us, we've internalized this checklist and we basically have the systems and processes in place so that if the worst were to happen with your campaign, or even if you were to get some sort of a warning from Kickstarter and Indiegogo, we immediately go through this checklist and essentially guide you through this crazy situation. And sometimes I think that's what's nice about working with somebody like Funded Today versus going it alone as well. So without further ado, let's go through these points. Number one, you got to determine the reason. How do you do that? You email Kickstarter and Indiegogo immediately, because usually they send you a template email that doesn't make any sense and you don't know what you violated. Generally, if you follow up aggressively, they will give you a little bit more details. Here's a couple things it could be, though. And you want to ask yourself these as you go about it, because sometimes you can apologize. So let's let's go through them. Number one, running multiple campaigns simultaneously. Hey, sorry, Kickstarter. I didn't know this. I had a campaign on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I have just canceled the one on X platform. Are we good now? Inadequate prototype section. Hey, I'm sorry about that. I just updated my prototype section. Here's a 30 second unedited, untouched, unfiltered video that shows exactly how my product works. Are we good now? Renderings rather than actual photographs. Hey, sorry. And again, don't do these things in the first place, by the way. Take our advice. Listen to our page design and our video episodes and just do it right to start. But if you do mess it up, here's how you fix it. <laughs> renderings rather than actual photographs. Don't put renderings on your page. If you do, change them out and take actual pictures of your product. Copyright infringement allegations. Why are you trying to copy Disney or Marvel? Don't do that. Don't lie to us if you are doing that. It's not a good idea. It's going to get your project suspended because we're going to raise you so much money. We're going to be so successful that the whole world's going to hear about your project and anything you did shady or dishonest is going to be exposed. Claims that your product has already been offered for sale on a different platform. Please don't go buy a product and tell us it's new from Alibaba. That's stupid. That's not going to work long term. And somebody else is going to do the same thing and kill your margins. You're not going to make any money long term anyway. Don't do that. Also, don't sell your product on your website or anywhere else before you go to Kickstarter or Indiegogo. They don't allow that, and they're going to catch on. They have entire teams of trust and safety that look into things if your project becomes successful. Now, if you want to launch your project and you don't raise any money, nobody's going to know anything because it doesn't matter because nobody's backing your project. All these things really only come to light when you become successful. These are among the most common reasons we've observed. And again, they're not the only possible ones. Kickstarter is not always very forthcoming about the reasons. Like we said, you got to email them a bunch. And usually they want you to figure it out. They don't want to tell you why you did it because they think you should know. And I, to, I understand their point there. So you may need to follow up persistently like Lobster Bag. Lobster Bag did nothing wrong. Remember that one. They did nothing wrong. They got suspended. Fortunately, Kickstarter realized their mistake. They admitted their mistake and let them relaunch. But most of the time, it's because you did something wrong and you weren't honest with Kickstarter, you weren't honest with Funded Today, or you weren't honest with yourself. Again, if you don't think you violated any of the reasons, you can't think of anything, the best way is to email Kickstarter. You can get them at support at kickstarter.com, legal at kickstarter.com, and start asking them, hey, I, I need to know what happened here. And usually, usually they have been nice and they don't suspend immediately. They will send an email and say, hey, we're going to suspend your campaign. You have five days to correct X, Y, Z. Sometimes they'll do that for you if it's not egregious, the, the thing that you violated. Well, I was just going to say that leads to the next point, which is to appeal the decision. If you believe or you know that they've made a wrong determination, then you need to present Kickstarter with the evidence, including even messages from their own team, showing that your project complies with its policies. We, we've even had campaigns where somebody had a product on Indiegogo, didn't work, and then they relaunched on Kickstarter. And they said, hey, is it okay if I relaunch on Kickstarter? Here's why I'm doing it. 
And literally somebody from Kickstarter said, yes, you can do that. And then a week or so or two into the campaign, Kickstarter said, hey, we're going to suspend your campaign. So you have to show Kickstarter what you're doing, your evidence, so they can look at it objectively and say, okay, they are in compliance. It was a mistake on our end. And look, the reality is we're all human. Businesses are human in the sense that they make mistakes, right? Because it's people who are running them, or if it's algorithms, it's people who wrote the algorithms and they make mistakes. And so if there's mistakes made, you need to present the evidence to help them see, here's why that was a mistake. Now, if Kickstarter has already suspended your campaign, you got to understand they will not reinstate your campaign under any circumstances. They never have. We hope and wish they would in the future because sometimes they literally have made mistakes and they're like, oh, whoops, sorry. That Lobster was bag. bad. And it's Lobster bag, literally email. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> it's crazy. But if it has not suspended it, then you might be able to avert that action. So please note that although Kickstarter may be callous, it is honest. So if it says that it'll cancel in 48 hours, then you'll enjoy this 48 hours to figure out how to proceed. And just a, just a side point on what Thomas is talking about here and, and kind of maybe hitting on point number one and two as well, determining the reasoning and then appealing the decision with Corey Hanna that we mentioned earlier, the one that raised nearly $2.5 million and became really successful. When you work with Funded Today, Thomas is an attorney and he doesn't represent you by any means. He doesn't even wear a legal hat, but he understands law really well. He was able to effectively communicate with these with the, with the company from Germany and petition on behalf of Corey Hanna and Freddie, the team of, of that of that campaign, Corey Hanna, and ultimately get, was it an injunction? I can't remember how far it went. It went pretty far and get the campaign reinstated essentially and able to be live on Kickstarter again. And this was crazy. There was no way it was going to happen. So I think sometimes working with a company like Funded Today, if you're wanting to raise a lot of money and you don't even know if potentially you're going to be running into any IP issues or anything like that, Sometimes working with an agency like us who's been there can be very effective. And I, I look to the Corey Anha story and I still, I guess I count my lucky stars and think of how lucky we were. But in reality, it wasn't lucky. It was Thomas's expertise with the law. It was his ability to communicate on behalf of Corey Hanna essentially to, to save that project. And it was a pretty remarkable change of events considering that it probably should have been suspended. But because we were able to work out all the logistics so quickly. Yeah, I mean, it was a million dollar loss at that point. And in the end, 2.5 million. Yeah. Yeah. They did like 1.7 million euros just on Kickstarter alone. And then another, you know, six, 700,000 on Indiegogo. So anyway, it, it, that's a, it's a tangent, but I, I think I look back and I think no one could have handled that except Thomas. So pretty cool story there. Contact your backers. That's the third thing. This is very important. We talked about this earlier as well. If suspension certain, you need to inform your backers because usually when you're suspended, Kickstarter doesn't let you talk to them anymore and not the same way that you can when your project is live. And that trust is going to be broken too. If you can be the first one to explain what happens, it's going to come across a lot better because Kickstarter sends everybody an automated email when your project is suspended or canceled that basically says, this person has violated, and it's this big long list of things we just went through in point number one, and they immediately think you've done something terrible. And if you haven't something terrible, it's good to let them know you haven't. It's good to get their emails, their phone number, whatever you can, so that you can contact them and figure out how you're going to relaunch successfully after you get past all the, all the red tape. And to really highlight what Zach said, you need to do this beforehand. When your campaign is suspended, you as the creator are not able to message the backers anymore. The backers can still message on the, on the board and have the discussion, but you can't participate in that and you can't send any of them a message. So you're left in the dark. I think the practice should change because it just causes so much confusion. I understand the flip side. It, you don't want to have some creator marshalling all of these backers to go message Kickstarter and, and tell them how horrible they are and to reinstate it, right? Like they don't want to deal with that either, right? So it's two sides of a coin and both both sides aren't ideal, but that's that's the approach Kickstarter has taken. Maybe there's other reasons I, I'm not aware of. I'm, I imagine there probably is. So you have to do it beforehand. Otherwise, the backers are left in the dark. And literally, when you have a whole bunch of people on the internet who have no information, you know how that goes. I, it's it's not going to turn out favorably for you. So, yeah, love it. Next point: preempt the cancellation. If suspension is certain but hasn't already been implemented, then preemptively cancel your own campaign after you collected your backers' contact info before Kickstarter and you go suspend you. This looks better. 
It ensures you'll continue to update your backers, unlike if Kickstarter suspends your campaign. It's a painful thing to do, but sometimes it's the right action to take. And the last, well, I guess not quite the last thing, but number five would be to reconsider the platform you're launching on, right? If you can negotiate a way to satisfy Kickstarter's requirements in order to relaunch on its platform, it's actually worth your effort to do so. So maybe they're saying, we're going to suspend it. Like you can't get out of this, but they'll still let you relaunch on their platform. Or maybe it happened and you didn't have time to notify your backers, but you can still relaunch. If you can talk with Kickstarter and relaunch on their platform, do that. Otherwise, you can usually transition to Indiegogo instead. Over the past few years, Indiegogo has become a little more strict. But again, they're a lot more open and understanding. And their customer support is usually more willing to lend an open ear. And one thing I do love about Indiegogo is their ability to distinguish what level your project is at. I think Kickstarter should probably integrate this into their platform. And perhaps it's coming in 2020. I don't know. But Indiegogo will let you say whether this is just a dream, like this is just an idea in my head, or whether you've got a prototype, or they'll even, they even have a new thing that guarantees shipping, I think. So Indiegogo will literally put their money where their mouth is and say, this product is so good. We've reviewed everything. We've looked at their prototypes. We know they're going to ship, and we're going to ensure that if you back this project, you will get your product. And I think that's a pretty cool thing that they're doing to try to build more trust on their platform. Yep. Number six, remobilize your backers. This is the point of why you contact your backers in step three. After you've relaunched your campaign, contact your original backers, persuade the replay, give them the discounts, let them know that because they stuck with you through thick and thin, you're going to hook them up on your next project. And by doing this, remember, that's the triple F. Essentially, you've got your, you've got your extra folks here. You've got your friends, family, and fools. These are your family. This is your tribe of people who decided to stay with you even after a cancellation or a suspension, and they can help you get that initial eight to 10 hour upon launch momentum that propels you to Kickstarter, trending, magic, all those good categories you want to rank in, newest. And by doing that, you have a much better chance of ranking higher in the platform and getting organic and direct pledges from the platform Kickstarter and Egogo themselves. And number seven is pretty straightforward, Thomas. Just resume your marketing. Proceed as before. This is uh, Shopbox 2.0. Cancellation, relaunch, and like we've said, we did nothing different on the marketing side of things. We just followed everything that Thomas thought needed to be changed for this product, relaunched, and the rest was history. By the way, if you if you need good product shots, and this is, oh, we're, we're totally not getting paid for this, but I want to say it. Get yourself a Shopbox 2.0. I love Aaron Johnson. I love the company. They're really good. Product photography is so important. We, when we do some of our Amazon marketing, we told people so many times their pictures were probably the thing that were killing them. Use the Shopbox 2.0. You'd be surprised what a world of difference it can make when you take higher quality product shots. So total aside, one through seven, just a recap for those of you who weren't paying attention as clearly as you should. Determine the reason. Two, appeal the decision. Three, contact your backers. Four, preempt the cancellation. Five, reconsider your platform. Six, remobilize your backers. Seven, proceed as before. And there you have it. That is everything we think you need to know about crowdfunding, suspensions, and relaunches. Thomas, anything else you want to add before we wrap this baby up? If you're being suspended, there's a good chance you're being successful. Now, hopefully it's not because you ripped somebody off or ripped some product off. but no. You're always going to run into hiccups when you launch a business. This is something to have on your radar and to make sure you do everything above board. But even if you're doing everything above board and you still run into these issues, follow these steps. If you're listening to this, it may be because you're dealing with this issue right now and we can help you with that potentially. And if not, if it happens in the future, you can come back and listen to this. Love it. All right, it is now time for our favorite part of the episode. These are Funded Today's Products of the Week. And I've got a personal one with you today I'd like to share. And this one I think fits perfectly into the aspect of a relaunch or a cancellation or maybe a platform issue. And I want to talk about it. This is my good friend, Tim. He's actually a personal friend in addition to a person who's really spent a lot of time for probably the last year or so. He has invented a product called DigiChill, currently live on Kickstarter right now not doing as well as everybody would hope. It's only raising a couple hundred bucks a day, but it is raising a couple hundred dollars a day, which means that people like the product. What is the product? DigiChill is a product that prevents your phone from overheating. So whenever your phone gets warm, your battery is being damaged. Stop the harm with DigiChill. That's the pitch. How does it work? It is very, very interesting. Essentially, 
and not and before we get into how it works, this also does quite a few things. Wireless Qi charging, that's QI, if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. This will increase your phone's lifespan. It'll safeguard your phone, charges your phone faster. But the, the part that it does better than anything else on the market is it charges your phone faster. Some people will ask about fans. Well, you know, use a fan and that will that will cool it. Really, in, if you go to his product page, you will actually be able to see thermal technology showing a phone using digital after six minute, after 60 minutes and a phone without. And the one image is basically a dark purple and the other one is like the sun, bright yellow. It works really, really well. It's the same technology that electric cars are using if you're kind of following the Elon Musk story. Electric batteries are cooled for longevity. And if you want your phone to last longer, and who doesn't? They're, I mean, they're a thousand bucks. Days. I just got a new one. Got the Samsung Galaxy Note 10 and got my wife the iPhone 11. They're, th they're like a thousand bucks a piece, right? If you want your phone to last longer, use the Digitil. It will cool your phone. It is amazing how it works. Again, I can't get into all the technology, but a lot of it's on the page. Have a look at it. And I, the last thing I wanted to say about this product was we've been asking the nearly 70 backers, why'd you back this? How'd you hear about it? What, what's going on? What, what makes you like this product? And the responses have been really amazing. Basically, Tim is following the exact steps that we were teaching in this episode because he knows people are backing it. Every day he's getting a couple people that back this product and they're saying, I love this. I love the technology. I can't believe somebody didn't think about this before. These are all things actual backers are saying. So we just got to figure out what's wrong here. Is it a price issue, a platform issue? What's the situation? Is it a presentation of the product issue? You know, does the product not look as good as it could? It's hard to know, right? And that is the idea behind a product like this, which I think has huge potential but just hasn't reached its full potential yet. Check it out. It's DigiChill, D-I-G-I-Chill, C-H-I-L-L. Thomas, what do you got for us? I wonder, Zach, and I had never thought about this, but there's another P issue at play here, and I've never thought of it in terms of RPs, but a prevention. In a way, you're preventing your battery from being damaged, and it's always harder to sell prevention than it is to sell a remedy, Right. Oh, your phone battery, is it dead? Does your phone battery die after half, half a day? Yeah, it does. I hate it. Use this and now it will, you know, it'll have a, a, a full charge and it will last the whole day again, right? Like that would sell really well, whereas this is prevention. So I don't know. And sometimes you might be able to change the, the presentation to convey that. But Prevention is really tough, isn't it? You only know you need it when you're buying the new iPhone. When you're spending the thousand bucks to get the new phone, you're like, gosh, dang it. I swear I bought this last, I bought a phone last year and spent a thousand bucks. So yeah, you make a good point. It, it reminds me of another product that I worked with probably nearly a decade ago. These were, uh, we called it Stop the Pop because they were called Ectio, E-K-T-I-O. Uh, John Starks, one of the famous New York Knicks was behind the product. We got to work with him a little bit on selling this product. And the idea was it, the shoes would make you not sprain your ankles. And I love them. I still wear them today to this very day. I've never sprained my ankle wearing Ectio shoes. And they have a couple different ways of doing it while still allowing you to have some pretty good momentum but they just never caught on because you only really wish you had the Ectio shoe after you hurt your ankle. You wanted to wear the Jordans or the LeBrons or the Kobe's or whatever else it was at the time instead. So you make a good point, Thomas. That's a good way to, that's a, that's a good thing to consider. My product of the week is I want everyone to go back in their mind to the time when they were a kid. And I'm pretty sure everybody has all had a chance to own at one point or another in their life, a rubber band gun. And, you know, the, the, the one that comes to my mind, you know, sometimes you got like some of the wood ones that has kind of like the, the wood clip that you can just pull the rubber band back mm -hmm. and then it just has the, the clothespin, you know what I'm talking about? And you just put the rubber band in there and you, and you push the rubber band or the, or the clothespin, you, you just push the end and it releases the rubber band, right? And so you got like a single rubber band shot. But then I remember having like a plastic rubber band gun back when I was younger and it had a wheel that would spin and you could put like a rubber band on it, but then you could spin it back a little bit and then put another one. And on the wheel, you could fit maybe five or six rubber bands. So you could have like this continuous action, right? You could shoot six rubber bands at a time. Well, this pro the product of the week I'm choosing is called the rubber band minigun. It literally is a fully automatic rubber band gun. It's made from wood. It looks incredible. It's like, holy smokes. Like if there was an analogy, you know, sometimes I, I kind of look at things. I'm like, man, it's crazy, right? You go to McDonald's to get like a drink and they're, they're huge, right? Or you, or you go to the gas station and their cups are so massive. I'm like, holy smokes. Like 
in the United States, everything is like supersized, right? I mean, there's even a documentary about that, right? Well, this is the supersized rubber band gun. It looks absolutely awesome, right? An adult would love this and kids would drool over this, right? You literally can put 144 rubber band guns into it and have automatic shots. Like this gun is incredible. Even if you're not going to get it, you have to go check it out. It's called Rubber Band Minigun. It's on Indiegogo right now. And again, it is awesome. Now the dad in me says, make sure you wear some safety glasses if you're going to try this guy out. I did barely become a dad over this last span of time. So had a baby girl. Wear some safety glasses if you're going to use the rubber band minigun. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm glad you, I'm okay. glad you have well, that dad instinct in you know. <laughs> I, was just, I was just thinking about it. Yeah, 140, 144 rubber bands coming at you. I had a lot of fun as a kid, and that sounds pretty amazing. Yeah, it so. sounds like for sure somebody's eyes going to get punctured. By the way, we raised this product a ton of money. This has been one of our most successful projects this year. So from just a marketing perspective, it would be good to look at that one. It converted extremely well. We're on Indiegogo in demand right now. Rubber band minigun. All right, Fund of Today Nation, that wraps this one up. As always, please let us know what you thought of today's episode on crowdfunding suspensions and relaunches. And by the way, if this episode saved you, if you're listening to this 10 years in the future, whatever, I don't know, in the next month or two, let us know. I'd love to hear about how, what we taught you did something good for you. Those are the kind of stories that keep Thomas and I pumped and make us want to keep recording more and helping you. We love getting stories like that. So please let us know. Hey, Zach, Thomas, that one really saved me. I loved point number three. I did it and it worked and thank you. Saved my product, and now I've got a million-dollar business. Something like that, right? Love to hear that. What's been your favorite episode so far and why? By the way, go check out the episode with Dell Backus and Osnap. That was the one that we did last time. We're getting a lot of good feedback on that. People loved it. We're going to bring another one like that next week, and you're going to love it. We're going to talk about prototyping and manufacturing, and we're going to get the very best expert in the world on this. He's the guy that actually helped him develop his product. So you're going to want to jump into this one. I think you're going to love it. Prototyping and manufacturing. And again, we'd love to hear from you. So email us, support at funded.today. Leave a comment on our website, funded today, funded.today forward slash podcast, or review us on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening platform. I love getting those reviews. I love learning what you liked. I even love learning what you didn't like. So let us know. We'll keep making these episodes better and better for you as we get better ourselves. And as always, remember, don't wait until tomorrow. Get funded today. Funded Today is the worldwide leader in rewards-based crowdfunding on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Combined, they have raised over $200 million and counting for thousands of new ideas and inventions worldwide. If you've got an idea for a new product or invention, visit FundedToday.com to speak with one of their experts. 